Good morning, everyone. Welcome back from the Easter holidays. I hope uh, you had a wonderful, blessed time with the family and as well rested for the next, or well, the second quarter starting now. Um, so we had, a, after our first session about all about solo, we had a lot of questions. Um, we thought, did you have a QA and a session? Um, I'll be brought in some more uh, panel experts and they are going to read out the questions and as, as was sent through by, by you guys and answer it. If you have more questions, you're welcome to uh, send it in the, in the messages, messages or we'll, we'll leave some more time afterwards. Thank you very much, Aubrey. Uh, uh, good morning and welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm going to ask Jenny to just introduce all the speakers. Um, unfortunately, where I am, we have load shedding and all of those things. So uh, I'm going to leave it in Jenny's hands. Uh, what will happen after she introduced all the speakers, uh, she will read the questions and uh, between us, we will answer. And if there's any more questions, please feel free just to post it and hopefully we will uh, get to them. Uh, if not, we will... Uh, 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 put it in writing and, and just let all the uh, participants have it. Thank you very much and welcome. Jenny, over to you. Okay, the first speaker that I would like to introduce you is Willi Roos from Strathafin. Willi has practiced as a property attorney for over 20 years. He was involved as a sectional title management for over eight years where he dealt with various, various municipal bills and interacted extensively with local municipalities. Billy started Strathafin in 2014 with the goal of assisting body corporates with their funding without catching them in a debt trap. Strathafin strives to be fair and equitable money provider for the sectional title industry. Uh, then we've got Aubrey, which a lot of you have met already. Aubrey qualified as a town and regional planner at the University of Pretoria, after which he spent the next 10 years gaining experience as a senior town planner at the City Council of Pretoria and the Department of Housing. He established Multiprof Property Intelligence in 1998. For the past 32 years, he's been acting as a consultant in the property industry, using his curiosity and ability to connect the dots between the industry professions. And then we move over to Glenn. Uh, Glenn is from Max Light. He runs a family business that's been in the solar industry for 34 years. They are, longest, they are the longest standing manufacturer of solar geysers in South Africa and one of the few companies who design and manufacture their own so, solar photovolic equipment. Given their long standing history with solar geysers, when the word hit the ground of the new B rated geyser in the mid to late 2000s, they felt the opportunity was right to re engineer their solar geysers with a view of focusing on the conventional electric geyser industry. Okay, that's who we have for today. So we're going to move over straight to the first question. And the first one is, how does the Minister of Finance's announcement regarding the tax incentives for solar installations affect community schemes, or are they excluded? Uh, Vili, I think perhaps that's one that you can help us with. So the incentive that was uh, announced by the Minister dealt with an incentive for private individuals and is not applicable to schemes as a general um, in respect of the scheme where a scheme wants to install solar for the use of the members of that scheme. Um, I think I read at the stage when, when this announcement was made that um, the minister said that there wasn't a lot of interest by schemes in respect of solar, which I think is absolutely, or she is absolutely wrong. Um, and it's definitely something that should be looked at um, uh, in, in respect of legislation to assist schemes to actually um, set up the solar um, panels and uh, inverters and batteries and so forth. Um, and it's definitely something that is necessary, but unfortunately it is in respect of individuals only. Okay, uh, but if I'm correct, uh, if an individual in a scheme would uh, invest in solar, it will, for the individual, be, be a, a tax uh, deductible. Correct. Um, an individual that, that 
obtained the rights uh, to um, do so um, will be able to then claim that incentive. But um, I mean, in the previous webinar that we had, Glenn, you and I, um, we actually discussed all the problems in that respect, um, the exclusive use areas that needs to be created on the roofs and so forth, um, and, the, and the fairness thereof and all those things that we've discussed. Um, but if you've gone through that process, you've got your rules in place, um, that protect the body corporate, that looks at the insurance issues, uh, that looks at the maintenance issues, that looks at um, the removal of panels and so forth uh, when somebody sells the unit. Um, when you've got that in place and an owner then installs, that owner will then be able to utilize that incentive. Correct. Okay. Aubrey, just to jump in on that, uh, uh, Billy's right. It's not actually for schemes. We, we're also what's called an ESCO, which is an ESCO services provider. And we've recently been in, in meetings with um, both ESCOM, Sanedi, CESA, um, and, and one or two other shareholders, if you want to call it that, that we, we, we were, it's resuscitation of the, it's resuscitation of the team that put together the ESCOM rebate program uh, back years ago for solar water heating. And, um, and I think we're going to see some changes to this thing. I'm just guessing, but I think we're going to see some changes to this thing um, because it's not being made attractive to it's not being made attractive to the high density space, and that is where the big savings can be can be achieved. Removing ones and twos of houses is 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 is, is going to be effective, uh, but it's far more effective to re remove two, three, four hundred units. Um, in the form of geezers or in the form of something. So yeah. I think this is still gonna change. I still think we're gonna see this thing morph in a different fashion. Uh, thanks, Glenn. We will follow with interest and, uh, and report back if, if there's any changes. Um, next question, Jenny. If a scheme has enough funds in their reserve fund, usually used for the 10-year repairs and maintenance plan, can, can such funds be used to maintain reliable electricity supply by adding solar panels to the common property infrastructure? It seems ridiculous to raise a special levy if at least some costs can be covered from the reserve fund. So this one's relating to the reserve fund. Okay, so I'll just jump in here. Um, a reserve fund is raised in accordance with a budget. Um, there's a whole plan that's set up behind that funding. Um, and in terms of the legislation, as it currently stands, a scheme or the scheme executives can only spend money in accordance with that budget. So if you have not budgeted for that, um, from a strictly legal point of view, um, it would not be um, possible to actually go and utilize that funds for something else that you didn't budget for. So the correct procedure would be to go back to owners and then get an amendment um, in respect of that budget to include um, the uh, solar system into that um, and then utilize that money. But the unauthorized use, or use of money um, by the trustees in respect of something that is not in the budget can't, uh, can't be done legally. Um, we see that happens in schemes frequently. Um, I think that just um, in respect of um, of, of everything in general and spending of money, uh, they are different points of view. Prof Paddock, for example, has the, the view that it, there must be strict compliance with that and you can never spend anything that was not budgeted for, um, also not overspent on that. Um, from a practical point of view, I think I have a bit of a different point of view. My point of view is that as long as you stay within the bottom line of your budget, then you can spend on, on items that have been budgeted for, and there can be savings made in different items. You can move money because that's just a practical issue. Um, but as long as you stay within that bottom line and those items did form part of the original, original budget. Um, so I think that... That is my take on this. Um, so I don't think that schemes can merely go and just spend money on that, taking money from, from one roof maintenance or a, a lift maintenance and now go and install solar panels. Okay. Uh, Billy, do you think that will include having to change the 10-year 
maintenance plan in a way, or or will this not affect uh, the maintenance at all? Uh, will this just be budgeted as a separate item then? Um, Aubrey, I think it will change your maintenance plan because, I mean, you've saved money in your maintenance plan um, for specific items um, to have sufficient cash flow that moment when that item, um, the, the uh, repairs and maintenance of that specific item becomes necessary. And once you've utilized that money for something else, then you either have to move that maintenance to a further period or alternatively you will have to increase the budget to make sure that you do have money at that stage in respect of that um, so my my thinking is that uh, if this is really necessary and it can't wait um, any longer then the trustee should rather go the route of a, a special levy um, in respect of that, um, but then it must comply with the requirements to raise a special levy in terms of the new act. Um, alternatively, um, they need to go out and borrow money to do so, um, and that also requires permission by owners. So you will have to call a special general meeting and you will have to get a, um, a vote from owners in that respect. Um, as, as required by the act as well so so yes it, it will have a definite influence on your on your maintenance uh, plan as well 100 uh, percent glenn anything you want to add um no not at this stage i think uh, billy summed it up perfectly uh, thanks thanks uh jenny next question yes. Uh, our next question, I think, Vili, you touched on it. Can solar installations be funded as our body corporate has limited funds available? Um, it can be funded. Um, obviously, one needs to go out and, and see where you can get your funding at the best possible price. Um, there are various ways in which it can be funded. Uh, scheme executives must just make sure that they understand the contract that they enter into um, properly. Um, I think at the previous webinar, we touched on it as well. We see that there are plans out there where they can lease these, um, uh, these equip this equipment. We see that there are power purchase agreements where the equipment belongs to somebody else and a rental agreement is entered into with the scheme for the space where this is put up. Um, we've had a look at a, a scheme yesterday uh, that entered in a power purchase agreement, and I think the average cost of electricity has now risen by 30%. So schemes must make sure that they understand exactly uh, what they enter into. Um, I actually answered on sectional title Living South Africa the other day, it's the new debt trap. Um, I honestly believe that one must be very, very careful in respect of the power purchase agreements, uh, make sure that there's, that electricity is sold at the correct price, understand exactly uh, what is the mix of electricity coming from the solar system and what is coming from ESCOM, um, that, it can, that it, there can be a differentiation between the two. Um, and understand what it is going to cost, what is the cost per unit going to be, and so forth. Um, so it can be financed, just make sure that you understand exactly what, what the terms and conditions are. Um, in general, this transaction will fall outside the National Credit Act. It will be a large transaction, over 250,000 rand with legal two legal entities um, that form part of the agreement. Um, so, um, build your protection in as a scheme in respect of your contract. Make sure that the provider is prepared to act within the um, boundaries of all the outlines of the National Credit Act. Uh, interest be charged in accordance with that, uh, the induplo uh, applicable in respect of that and so forth. So make sure that you understand the agreement um, um, we, we know that, that schemes are run by normal people that, that don't necessarily have the financial knowledge and acumen. Um, before you enter into an agreement like that, make sure that you understand the terms and conditions. Go and see your attorneys. Uh, let them go through it. Make sure that, that you understand exactly what, what that agreement entails. Is that uh, a type of service that Strata Fern offered to uh, sectional title complexes to assist them with these type of very difficult uh, decisions? Um, 
uh, Aubrey, we, we, don't, we don't go through the contracts uh, in general in respect of um, other service providers. Um, we do uh, give a service or we do have a product, um, but our product is a term loan. So our um, money that we will give a scheme in that respect will be over a fixed period of time at a specific interest rate so that they understand that they pay capital and interest um, and at the end of the period, the equipment belong to them. Um, so I would think that that is the, the most clean way of dealing with this, um, to enter into lease agreements, power purchase agreements, and all these fictitious or difficult transactions to understand um, is, is, is very risky for a scheme, and especially where people don't have the knowledge to actually understand um, the inter intricacies of, of that contract. So, but we, we don't in general go and look at other people's contracts and say, well, be aware of that and be aware of that. It's just that we were asked to, to refund or refinance a, a particular scheme's uh, equipment that actually entered into a power purchase agreement. Okay. Okay. Uh, we're going to move on to the next one. This one so, is from Glenn. Can I just um, add to Lily's little statement there, if that's that's a code? Yes, please do. Is that? Uh, we consider sort of Stratifin to be one of our finance partners in what we do and stuff like that. And because we find that the 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 terms are are proper and fair and and as it should be done or how we believe it should be done we don't believe in this ever in the evergreen type of financing system or this as, as billy refers to it the the, the the power purchase agreement where actually you never own the equipment it's on a lease forever and ever and ever uh, and it's 20 30 year contract um, um and and even up to 15 you know 15 to 30 years i've seen um and, and there's actually uh, um, the solution or the equipment that's installed is, is sort of tailored more to the finance repayment rather than to the requirements and needs of the complex, which which um, is typically seen in a centralized sort of solar solution. So in terms of financing equipment, um, I, I would strongly suggest that it's, it's done very much, excuse the layman's, I'm, I'm not a financier, but very much on the basis of uh, you know a standard HP or a lease agreement or a something over a fixed short term five to seven years you know you could even extend it um, I think they have a rent to own solutions over ten years but anything more than that um, you know if the ownership of the goods don't transfer to that of the complex I really don't think it's a good solution at all because otherwise they don't derive any benefit from having solar on their roof in any fashion because they continuously pay for usage and not for savings or they don't benefit from the savings so i do think that uh, many people today in, in freestanding houses add these sorts of finances onto their bonds extend their bonds um, uh, uh, um, to, to to cover solar and i would strongly suggest using entities like strata to especially in a sectional title environment where you can have a fixed loan term over a reasonable period and at which point the goods transfer to the transfer the ownership to the body corporate yeah i can just say that when you enter into an agreement you must make sure that you have a one pager that says this is what you borrowed this is the amount of interest this is the amount of additional costs um, admin costs and so forth this is that you will pay over the period so that you actually at the end of the day know exactly what this um, equipment costs um, and then make a decision based on that so get that one pager summary of what the cost of your finance is um, so that you know what's going on because lots of these agreements are tailored in a way to to actually just catch the the scheme into this perpetual payment of interest um, over a very long period of time and owners are not going to see the benefits of that equipment like Glenn said so it's not the right thing for a scheme to actually well they must be very careful um, when they when they enter into that type of agreement um, 
those. So it's 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 a dangerous um, game that schemes might play in in that respect. So I, w- I would be very very wary in respect of of the financing. And fortunately, the banks are not really. I'm interested in financing schemes. Um, mm-hmm. We've had this discussion at um, at the let's get physical um, events as well. Why the banks don't do it? Because they then compete with their own bonds. So if the scheme does not pay, um, then they must execute against their own bondholders. That bondholder might not be in arrears with his bond. And at the end of the day, they're competing against their own bond for payment. Um, and they have to then sell the property in terms of um, uh, High Court Rule 46, and then um, at the end of the day, um, there won't be a reserve price, and they stand to lose um, in respect of of their bond, but gain in respect of the payment of the solar equipment, or vice versa. So the banks are not yeah. really interested yeah. in respect of of that type of um, financing for schemes. Can I can I just ask everybody that are not on the panel to just switch their um, the or mute their um, the uh, computers uh, because we continuously find somebody having conversations over the phones and so forth while um, we're busy with the discussion. Um, so can I just ask everybody that is not part of the panel to then just mute their um, the computers? Thanks. Thank you, Billy. Uh, Glenn, this one is directed to you. We want to go solar in the complex, but the costs are very high. What should we do and how should we do it? Is it possible just to install solar for a guardhouse and the common property lightning? Or what size systems would we use? Please elaborate on gas panels and solar geysers. Uh, thanks, Jean. It's, if you want to go solar, the very first thing you've got to do is find somebody that, that's prepared to come out, sit with the trustees or sit with the managing agent and the trustees, and I believe develop a solar policy. Look at what is on the market, look at what the possibilities are for the complex, um, and look at sort of a scenario that would best suit the complex. Unfortunately, there's no silver bullet that does everything in one shot. Um, Build a solar uh, policy suitable for the complex, the roof orientation, the roof structure, the design, the layout, sometimes they're multi-story, sometimes they're single story, um, and have somebody sort of really do a proper walkthrough. Um, is it possible to separate guardhouse, common property lighting, houses? Yes, very much so. In many instances, the guardhouse has its own DB board, and in that DB board is, is essentially typically your security equipment um, and access control equipment, um, and that, in my mind, is effectively why people live in a complex. People don't particularly live in a complex, I don't believe, to bribe with the, the general group of people in the complex, they live there for security, um, amongst other things, but security probably being the highest ranking. Um, so I do believe that it's it's now, I don't know what the right term is, but considered reasonably necessary that there are solutions that could be implemented um, for just the guardhouse to make sure the energizers on the electric fence are working, to make sure the booms and gates are opening and closing, to make sure that the, the, the access control is managed. So, so there's definitely a, a scenario where you could just do the guardhouse. Um, you can also just do the lighting on the common property in a separate, in a separate type uh, solution. Uh, I'm far more in favor of multiple smaller systems scattered throughout the complex, um, thus eliminating a single point of failure and giving you a far more reliable solution throughout. It can all be treated as one installation or one package when you when you finance a thing like that but it's far better to have multiple small systems running throughout than trying to have one big system and if there's a problem with that you're back to square one with load shedding. Um, so you could do common property lighting you could do the guardhouse you could do the gates you could do the energizers all as one system or single systems um, and, and that would that would cover i believe most of the needs. I also think it eliminates a, an element of liability, which I believe is becoming more and more a an issue because there are solutions out there. For example, if if there's a lighting issue in a stairwell and somebody falls down a flight of stairs and breaks their neck because the lighting hasn't been done, um, I, I, th- I think 
sooner or later there's going to be a somebody challenging them and i know that there was one in cape town very similar to that um and i do think sooner or later people are going to be pushed to light common property to light access in and out of a building if there's load shedding and there is a fire how do you get out of the building if those gates or booms are closed um i do think that that's that's an important thing and i think that's coming back to the perspective of how you look at solar for a complex and i think the trustees and body corporate must look at so for a body corporate as as an isolated thing rather than being pushed by unit one unit two unit three to put solar onto the complex treat the common property and and the body corporate as priority and then start considering the others perfect uh, this one is asking, uh, what would be the best option to follow if owners want to install new solar systems in a sectional title scheme? Each owner individually or through a lease agreement with a body corporate as a communal project, which would be the preferred method? It's, it's unfortunately going to be driven by opinion. Um, and everybody's going to have opinion on that. Um, in, in my little bit of experience with this sectional title mm -hmm. monster, um, I personally believe that the insurance is owned by the body corporate, the roofs are owned by the body corporate, there's a whole lot of stuff that's already owned by the body corporate, the product, the levy is a product of the expenses, if, an ex if, if, if there's a general agreement to enter into a financing space where they finance the systems, surely it's a smart solution to then adjust the levies to accommodate a finance agreement and let the body corporate roll it out either on a large scale throughout the complex. Um, and again, I would treat it as individual systems for every unit rather than one single system that supplies the whole complex. But, but again, that's my opinion. And, and the next salesperson or the next business owner, whatever you want to call it, is going to sit with a whole different mindset as to the right way to do it. I, I personally am not into the idea of a centralized system supplying the whole complex. Okay. Uh, can an application to install solar in a sectional title scheme be declined and what on what grounds? That's for you, buddy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the trustees, is on you. Yeah, again, um, so, so the trustees must, must take uh, all the factors into consideration when they decide if they're going to allow uh, a solar system for an individual owner. Um, in respect of the scheme. So we've had the discussion on the previous occasion when we discussed this regarding roof space, for example. So there has to be an equitable division of the roof space. So if you have a high rise building with very limited roof space, then the question is who's going to be entitled? Is it going to be on a first come first serve basis? Um, or is it going to be on an equitable basis? So everybody will have space for one little panel um, so, so it depends on, on the circumstances of every scheme. If there's sufficient roof space, then you will obviously go to a, a, a situation where you will allow it more easily. If there's limited roof space and you need to then create exclusive use areas, but there is still sufficient, but it has to be organized in a proper way, then that can be done. Um, and then the body corporate needs to look at all the other factors, for example, insurance. What is the risk um, that is created by installing this? Who's going to be um, liable for the maintenance and upkeep of this? Uh, so all these factors need to be taken into consideration. Um, how does it look? Is, is it going to be all different types of panels? Is it going to be installed in different manners and fashions? What is that going to do to the harmonious look of the scheme? So all these things need to be taken into consideration um, when the trustees make that decision. And that's going to differ from scheme to scheme. Um, I mean, in, when we started with the solar uh, discussions, um, when, when the load shedding started, we were contacted by a scheme in Durban, a high rise scheme. And at the end of the day, they decided, and Glenn is not in favor of a communal system, but they decided to go to a communal system, but to run the common property. Um, so to run the lifts, to, to run the lights on the stairs and so forth. So they went for that solution at the end of the day. So, so it's all dependent on what 
happening in the scheme. And I think the trustees must um, get as much knowledge as, poss as they possibly can um, and then utilize that knowledge when they make these decisions. So obviously there will be certain, certain circumstances where it can be declined, but there will also be circumstances where they will allow it. Um, so it's dependent on the scheme, but it should be it should be a decision taken with uh, knowledge and skill, um, and carefully considered uh, decision. Really to, just to add to that, that in, in that sort of setup, I would be very much in favour of that sort of centralised system for that. Yeah. For for that scheme, when I talk centralised system, it's more about how the usage of power is distributed amongst all the units, rather than how it's distributed from within the common property of the complex. So I, would, I wouldn't I would be against treating the common property as a centralized system, Lift, lifts, lights, et cetera, et cetera, in the common property space. That, that could be one system. But when you have one system trying to supply 340 units with power and you can't decide, you can't eliminate load, for example, you can't take geysers off, you can't take stoves off, you can't take um load or from those units um, because you're just supplying them power that's the centralized system that i refer to when you inject power into a grid and you cannot eliminate usage loads behind that behind the the homeowner's meter um perhaps uh, i can just add or perhaps Oz can mention uh, whenever individuals uh, are allowed to install and we need to register exclusive use areas that will also mean that the rules must be changed and therefore you will need the support of 75 percent of people at the special meeting to have that resolution taken now if you want to implement anything that is going to benefit a few people and uh, negatively affect the rest, I think you might battle to get those uh, changes to the rules approved. Um, I don't know what your opinion is on that, Billy. Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, the rules needs to be approved. I think we've had this discussion as well, also on sectional title living South Africa. We've had a discussion, long discussions about the rule changes and what should be in there, the stuff that needs to be looked at uh, when a scheme actually does this. Um, I think the most important thing, obviously, at the end of the day, is the maintenance, the, the burden of maintenance on who does it for, and then insurance. Those things are, are very, very important, and schemes must make sure that they deal with that in their um, rule changes. Okay, the next one is, is there a time frame or a limit to wait if you're an owner in a sectional title scheme and you apply for, for the body corporate to install a new individually owned solar systems? If no feedback is received, can one assume that permission is granted to continue with such installation? Unfortunately, <laughs> you can't. Um, oh, no. <laughs> so, so, so people can't just do what they want uh, on the common property. Um, they do require permission. And if there is no proper permission given, then there is no permission. Um, so one can't assume that then a no answer is a permission. Um, so I would not recommend people going ahead and installing their own solar systems because the trustees have not replied to them. Um, as I said, it's it's a decision that needs to be taken carefully. Um, I mean, our offices are in Waterfall in Midrand, and uh, we are in these single, um, well, double-story offices, but they're like single blocks with four tenants in a block. And um, we've got pitch roofs and we uh, required the body corporate because it's a sectional title scheme as well. And we required the body corporate to give us permission to install solar for our business. And they had engineers here. And at the end of the day, they decided that the trusses cannot be a load in respect of that. So, so trustees need to do lots of things. They need to get an engineer there to make sure that the, the trusses can hold the load um, that um, that the insurance is in place, that the maintenance uh, requirements are in place um, and so forth. So you can't just accept that uh, a no answer is a yes. Uh, so definitely not. 
Yes. Uh, well, again, I think one must just focus on it that the, the body corporate is actually the decision maker eventually if there's individual Correct. owners that want it. And therefore, uh, it should be a, a joint venture basically with everybody understanding the complexities. And uh, I have lots of empathy with trustees in, in these situations where they are really out of their depth and there are so many different opinions. Even between the experts, there's uh, not consensus on all issues. So, and rather be safe than sorry, as, as Vali said before. It is so easy to, to make a decision that is not in the interest of the body corporate in the long run. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, owners must just be patient and, uh, and, and make sure that the right decisions are made for the whole complex and not only for themselves. Yeah, I can just add, I mean, uh, we need to decide, um, is this improvement that is being made, um, is it a, um, because it says, uh, management rule 29 says the body corporate may on the authority of a unanimous resolution make alterations or improvements to the common property that is not reasonably necessary. So the first question is, is it reasonably necessary? I think nowadays we can, in general, it is, so then, um, it's not a unanimous, but then if you now go to prescribed management rule 29.2, the body corporate may propose to make alterations or improvements to the common property uh, that are reasonably necessary, provided that no such proposal may be implemented. Though all members are given at least 30 days notice with the details of the estimate cost to be associated, details of how the body corporate intend to meet the cost, um, motivation for the proposal and so forth. So that is just a quick summary of of uh, prescribed management rule 29 and that is when we deal with it as a scheme for or a system for the whole scheme um, and individuals but i mean at the end of the day as Aubrey said it is a decision by the owners of the scheme that needs to be made um, and implemented by the trustees at the end of the day so yes um, it is it is a it's a complex issue it can't just be i'm asking you in seven days later if you don't like it or if you didn't, I didn't hear back from you, I'm proceeding and installing my own stuff on the roof. It's not your roof, you can't do so. Okay, on to the next one. If a body co corporate has enough capacity of the powering common property infrastructure, can a body corporate sell access, solar generator electricity to individual members who opt in? <laughs> Sorry, say that Anyone. again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> can electricity be sold back, generated on common property, back to individual members who opt in? Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, you can only sell electricity if you are registered as a reseller. So firstly, um, we need to understand is the body corporate then the reseller, the body corporate then needs to apply for the right to be a reseller from the council. Um, then if they get that right to be a reseller, then they are entitled to on sell electricity, but that electricity has to be sold at the same price than what the municipality actually deliver the electricity to a scheme in, in accordance with um, what they receive it from ESCOM. So if they charge 163 per unit, then the body corporate must charge the same amount. Uh, they can't charge a different amount. So body corporates will be able to, to on-sell electricity if they are a reseller. The, the other question then that also arises is how do we determine what electricity was generated um, and supplied by the body corporate, what was generated and supplied by ESCOM, so the differentiation between the two types of electricity um, so that one knows um, that this was in actual fact uh, generated and supplied and that you're not paying uh, for something that that is that is not there um, so yeah so so you need to have the proper metering in place and so forth and um, and if it's in that instance it's going to be a centralized system and there would be no way of the homeowner knowing or anybody knowing whether or not he's using solar generated electricity or ESCOM electricity yeah or it would just be a consumption of electricity they don't know where it comes from. They don't know how it gets there. They know nothing other than the fact that their toaster is working or their kettle is working. There would be no, no way of measuring it. Um, in terms of the, I can't speak on the sectional title side, but in terms of the legislation from ESCOM, because you're not selling over a wall, 
uh, and it's actually simple to say that the, you have, you can't sell over a wall. Uh, I would question whether or not you could sell within a complex. Um, I don't think I've never investigated that, but it's it's it's. Uh, I, I I don't I, th I think it's going to be tricky because technically you can't sell to your neighbour, but if your neighbour is in your same property, I don't know how that works. Um, that's my understanding of it. Yeah, we, um, Glenn, we can, um, maybe it's, it's something that I will discuss with Hein and um, uh, Hendrik here at my office. I mean, they come from the municipal space, um, but in general, I mean, I would think it is the same type of situation that you have when um, you have applied as a scheme to be the reseller of the electricity coming from the council. Um, that is my take on it, that, that you would be in exactly the same situation as a reseller of electricity, uh, where you've got the prepaid meters and so forth that is installed in a complex. So it will be a similar situation, I would think. Um, I would agree, yeah. Difficult, difficult, to, difficult also then to determine, um, and, and especially when you are now in a, in a power purchase agreement, then it's also difficult to determine what electricity has come from where. Um, like I said yesterday, we were looking at something where the electricity has now jumped up by 30%, um, and you can't actually explain why. Um, so it's, it's a very difficult situation. You are, so I think there's lots of lessons still be to be learned um, out of this uh, whole solar thing. The centralized thing, Billy, is, is, is uh, sorry, we digress, but it's, it's this increase of power. I've seen two schemes where the increase of consumption has the homeowner is paying more than double the yeah. electrical bill per month. And huh. it's, it's, it's based purely on the fact that they're manipulating the temperature of the geysers. And mm. by manipulating the temperature of your geysers, you can. You can double your temp, your, your you can double your electrical bill. Sixty percent of your geyser of your consumption comes from your geyser, and by manipulating that, you can do that. So a lot of I've seen that on two occasions now, which is quite cunning by the the, the power purchase agreement, but yeah, not not fantastic from the owner's perspective. Yeah, I I I also, and I think you and I have had this discussion where we were discussing um, where they are saying, but what we are trying do is we're utilizing the geyser as a battery. So what we're doing is we, we're upping the temperature on the geysers. And in yeah. that way, uh, there's less electricity than used during the night because you've upped the, the temperature of the geyser by putting more hot water hot into water. the geyser yeah. during. But there's other, there's other problems with that as well. I mean, utilizing a geyser as a battery uh, places a larger risk on, on, the, on the geyser um, blowing up um, and and that that creates then other problems because then you have a problem with your insurer in the sense that that you're going to have a, a huge amount of claims in respect of geysers that are burst um, so, so and that's going to create a different type of uh, increase then as well because what yeah. what what the insurer pays out the insurer recovers at the end of the day yeah. um, so he will just come back and increase the premium and that's that and the first one we were the first one we were alerted to was um, a um, an insurer phoned us and said to us please get to site we do quite a lot of insurance work and they said please get to site and look at what's going on with these geezers because they they're about to give notice on the policy and it was exactly that that they the the concept of using a geezer as a battery and they heat the water excessively and they think that if you heat it to seventy degrees the consumption of hot water during wash time or shower bath time whatever they use that much less hot water because it's so much hotter so you get more out of the geyser the problem is to cost to heat that water once um, it costs you double and then to maintain what we call standing losses on a geyser is what chases the temperature so that differential at 70 degrees to ambient is what continuously chases the element on and off, on and off, on and off, on and off. Whereas when you set it less, that differential is less. So yeah, it just costs Thank you, Glenn. Um, Jenny, I think we have about 10 minutes left. I wonder if we shouldn't go to some of the questions that was asked uh, in, in the webinar itself. Uh, I don't know if you can do that for us, Jenny. 
I'm quickly having a look. Uh, can a hybrid uh, sectional title scheme allow members to install their own solar system and must this be put into the house plans? Okay, I'm not sure exactly what uh, what is referred to as a hybrid scheme, but in, in sectional title, of course, as we know, uh, all the roofs belong to the body corporate. And therefore, if individuals want to install it, uh, one needs to look at registering exclusive use areas <clears throat> for the panels on the roof. And as we have discussed, there is various ways that one first needs to ensure that everybody is treated the same then of course those must be put into the rules and just a, a point of interest when registering exclusive use areas and that's something that we often prepare plans for is that uh, one must ensure that the roof areas that you want to allocate as exclusive use areas is suitable for that purpose um, you can't give uh, some people north facing, some west, some south, and think everybody will be happy with it. Then another uh, important factor is to look at, at trees, because once you create exclusive use areas for your gardens, especially as well, it becomes more difficult to deal with trees that is causing uh, a problem for some of the exclusive use areas that is allocated for solar, because trees might uh, have shadows and uh, you might not have much of, of sun on your exclusive use area. So uh, the processes must be followed. It can be done, uh, but the processes need to be followed. And again, I think it is necessary to make use of uh, uh, professional people to assist with that. Um, as well uh, with the plans, as well as with the rules, because that will make or break uh, the allocation and the future cost for the body corporate of allowing uh, these exclusive use areas. Just, uh, just to add to that, uh, Aubrey, if, if there's a hybrid inverter, if the question is around a hybrid inverter, a hybrid inverter makes use of batteries, grid, and oh. solar panels. So that could be installed internally um, and just make use of batteries for security of supply until such time as the complex decides on a solar policy as to whether they're going to allow people to use batteries or not or whatever the case may be. So I don't okay. know. It's a question. Okay, thank you. Yes, I think that that was perhaps more more the question. Um, again, perhaps Glenn, you can just uh, uh, we have discussed before once owners have installed different type of hybrid systems in their units, it becomes more difficult to then have a centralized uh, panel system because everything is not compatible necessarily. Am I, am I correct? 100% uh, or 100%. Your, your, your system has somewhat got a match. And when I say match, you can't just put panels onto an inverter because that's the size you, that's what you want to do. You've got to have a specific voltage on your panels that supply on the inverter that come to the battery. So, so it's got to be sort of all in line. And that's one of the reasons also that I'm sort of an advocate for, for the body corporate owning, you know, the panels and maybe even the, the inverter portion, which, which is a bit controversial because it's inside. Um, mm. um, because then at least you've got, you've, you've standardized on the heart of the system being the, the inverter and the panel arrangement the batteries, as long as the voltage is of a, of, a, of, of a suitable size battery, you could pick lithium batteries, gel batteries, you know, stacks of batteries, racks of batteries, or five or six, or five or six different types or co uh, collections. So, so you could sort of size your, 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 your battery to, to what you want. Obviously, uh, you don't want too big a battery if you've got quite a small array, because then you're just going to use grid to charge. So yeah hybrid in hybrid inverters can go inside with batteries to 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 ensure that the people have got um, security of supply okay uh, Glenn, thank this you is also relating to the one where you told us about the geyser temperature may the body corporate then take a decision to check all the temperature settings on each unit um i, I mean they, they possibly could if they wanted to um they could if they wanted to uh, 
you know, they might pay a plumber or pay somebody to go around and check those and set them to a specific temperature. Um, the benefit of doing that is if the complex was three, 400 units and all of the temperatures of the geezers were sitting at 65, 70 degrees because the people weren't really paying much attention to it. And you brought that down to sort of 60 degrees being sort of the average, um, you could potentially save not only the homeowner a chunk of change, but but also the body corporate because you start splitting the, the BC into a different um, a different uh, a stepping category in terms of how much they use. And that could have a significant savings on their bottom line as well. But this is all, you know, it, it's not to say they will have a savings that they they very well could have a savings and, and quite a significant savings with that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Sandy is asking, how do we vet and select the right contractor? There are so many out there. It's very clear we handle this from a sectional title perspective, but how do we handle this from beginning to end on a home owners association perspective? We've solar's gone when the Eskom rebate program started back with the solar water heaters. We went from seven of us sitting around a table uh, that we had to bring our own tea and coffee because there wasn't budget for it to yeah. over 750 people. Um, and suddenly we had 750 experts around the table and everybody was an expert. You had people importing stuff all over the show. Uh, today we sit with less than seven around the same table, trying to resuscitate and trying to reinstate the solar water heating space to get into this space, into this, um, into this sort of savings and, and stuff with solar. Um, so the, the growth and expansion and contraction is massive. And today you just need to drive around the streets to see every third bucky is a solar expert. Whereas two years ago, even a year ago for that matter, if you saw one by mistake, it was a, like it was completely odd. What, you know, where do they even get business from? Um, so, so just by the nature of it, you're going, to, you're going to have a massive influx of people that today were, were today are experts, but yesterday were you know, running a business, selling sweets. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I can just say that in general, um, you need to deal with somebody that that is registered as a as a master electrician. So, so firstly, make sure that that you are dealing with somebody that is registered with the department DOI, Department of what is or DOL, Department of Labor. Now. So, the, registered as a master electrician. Um, because in terms of the sun's reg uh, regulations, they have to uh, they have to sign this installation off, um, and and provide a COC. I also understand that you require more than one COC, so you require a COC for the AC and the DC installation. Um, and I understand that there is uh, draft regulations that's also going to require that the whole system be set out on the, your COC that says exactly um, what has been installed and what type of wiring was used and so forth. So, um, so yeah, there, there, there are um, changes on the way in respect of SUN's regulations, but the stage it is just a normal electricity installations um, and therefore you require somebody that that has the necessary skill and knowledge and that is registered to, to do so so first things first are you registered um, can you give me references go and speak to people that where the installations was done is it working is it not working and so forth um, but it's it's a very complex field um, I mean, I've been trying to read on it the last six months, and the more I read, the more confused I get. Um, so, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's Is just it? important to to mention the 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 basic thing that if it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. Um, complexes are very often very price sensitive, and. Uh, Price is not the only determining factor that one should consider uh, when making these type of decisions. And, 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 and I don't want to be controversial here and say that you don't need a COC in some instances, but there are instances where installing solar, you don't need a COC. For example, if you put it on a gate motor, if you put it on an energizer, um, it does nothing to the system, the, the actual unit itself uh, accommodates for it and it's a case of connecting two wires 
So there are instances where you do, and there are instances where you don't need a COC. Um, mm -hmm. um, but when you're doing large-scale installations, as Vili says, you need somebody that can sign off a COC and somebody that can, an electrician that can sign off a COC. And the larger scale stuff, when you're supplying power to a house or to a guard house or to something like that. And that person must be in control of that installation. So it doesn't help to get somebody else in. Vili, you've Hello. muted yourself. Sorry. Um, yeah, so the regulations require that that person be in, in charge of that installation. So it doesn't help to get a COC after the fact. You need somebody that, that knows what he's doing, installing it, and then signing the COC. Okay. Thank you, Billy. Um, I think we have another minute or so. Uh, Jenny, I'm sure there's enough questions. Can you, uh, perhaps we can deal with one more question if possible. Okay, let's end off with this one. What if the unit is sold? Can solar systems be seen as movable property? Um, uh, it's, it's not easy to move a solar system once it's installed. Um, panels are probably the hardest, but if, if if the body corporate, for example, wanted to say that, you know, everything's got to be movable. Uh, in our instance, my immediate thought is I would build boxes and cases and stuff that were removable um, yeah. for, the, for the equipment. So, yeah. yes, it can happen, but it's, it's not easy to do. Well, uh, perhaps we, uh, I prefer to just have a look at, as we look at any other uh, stuff that is added into, into a, a unit or onto exclusive use areas. Basically, once it's the installation, it is part of what uh, you buy when you buy it. So personally, I think one should try and prevent uh, the option that people can remove panels, uh, as we all know, uh, there can be negative impact on the roof areas, people getting on and off the roof, um, drilling into towels, moving towels. So uh, personally, I would believe that in complexes specifically, it should be in the rules that once uh, it is uh, installed, it becomes permanently part of the exclusive use area for that unit. And uh, it, it, it can just become very complicated if you every two months or three months have new tenants and each one wants to get onto the roof, install their own um, panels and then remove them again. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's a slippery slope when you allow uh, owners or, or tenants to put on and remove as and when they like. I don't know, Billy, what's your opinion on it? Um, from a legal point of view, I think the normal rules um, apply. So you will have to go and decide or you can have, have a look at what the person's intent was. Was the intention there that it must be movable or not movable? And you're going to look at the way that it was installed. Is it done in a permanent fashion or in a fashion that you can remove it? So those are the, the type of things that the law looks at to determine if something becomes part of the immovable object. Um, so you will apply those rules. Um, and as you said, you don't want to go down that route because then everybody's going to say it was my intent to make it movable. And you will have people on the roofs the whole time. So you have to write it into your rules. That's why we said it in the beginning as well of this webinar, that make sure that your rules are tailored to make make sure that the body corporate is protected because if everybody is going to start drilling into the roof um, every three mm -hmm. months you're going to have huge problems in respect of your roof very quickly um, so it has to be built into the roofs uh, into the rules yes okay yeah and important to understand that those uh, damages to the roof will be for the uh, uh, for the uh, will be the responsibility of the body corporate, so that will be paid by levies that you will pay. So I think once people understand the consequences to their pocket, they would not like other people to remove solar panels from roofs. 
Probably that's okay. all that we've got time for. Thank you so much, Billy and Glenn, and you as well. Aubrey, anything from your side, Vimpy? I, I think Vimpy is on the mm -hmm. roof removing his solar panels. <laughs> those, those batteries that are flat, Vimpy. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. People running their mouse wasn't here. Um, it was quite technical today. Um, thank you very much for the all input and insight into everything. Um, yeah, I think we could. There is a bit more we can discuss on the actual practicality on how or what people will need to do that. But um, thank you very much for your time. Hundred percent. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye.